If you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 3. By the way, I do want to thank Alex Holt for covering uh, for me last week. Words out, Alex. I heard you did a good job. So praise God for his, his goodness. So thank you for doing that. Mark chapter 3. We begin today at verse 22. And there we read, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we ask you now to speak to us from your word, help us to learn what you have said, and we do pray that you would bless us. And I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we come to this passage. Our Lord's public ministry has been ongoing. We saw a couple of weeks ago that Jesus chose the apostles to be with him. As the opposition increased, Christ then called his disciples and chose out 12 to be his witnesses to be his uh, servants, but also to, to help lead his people. So we see that in the face of opposition, you know, if looking at it kind of on a practical level, the Lord organized his troops is what he did. Um, he called 12 men. One of them he knew was going to betray him, as he says in John's Gospel, if not I chosen you 12, and yet one of you is a devil or a demon. He knew Judas was going to betray him, but it was part of God's plan and purpose. And Jesus didn't make Judas betray Jesus. Judas did that of his own will. But when God re withdraws his grace, those things happen. But we see then, as he began to preach, right before this, we're told that his kinsmen, in verse 21, as the people came together, were told his own people, when they heard about it, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he's out of his mind. He's beside himself, as the old King James. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. So we see the opposition group, one from his own family members, because that's what that means, his own kinsmen. We're told in John's Gospel that his own brothers didn't believe in him. We see at the end of this chapter, although we didn't cover it today, that his brothers and his mother came standing outside. They sent to him calling him in verse 31, and that goes along with what we read uh, in verse 21 that his brothers, and they brought along Mary also. I don't think she was part of that group that thought he was beside himself, but they did bring their mother along, and it appears that they were going to try to restrain him because they weren't looking at what he was teaching or what he was doing. They just thought, this is getting out of hand. He's got thousands of people following him. He's got opposition. They may have thought and told themselves, we have to stop this because the authorities in Jerusalem now are pretty upset, and they're going to kill him. They're, there's talk now of, of putting him to death because he's making messianic claims, etc. For whatever their motivation was, um, they failed in doing it, and Christ identifies his true mother and brothers and sisters as those who do the will of God, as he says, um, or those who were there with him to be taught. But we go back to this passage that we're looking at now, and we see the opposition that came from the scribes. It says they came down from Jerusalem. So these were not Galileans. Jesus is up in Galilee teaching. But these men came from Jerusalem. Now we read earlier 
you remember the man with the withered hand, that there were people from all around, and it specifically mentioned scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem. They came down from Judea to see who is this Jesus? He's got this massive following. And they didn't come with a good attitude. They came not just skeptical, but they already had decided to be in opposition to him. And so they came down. And when they see the works that he does, and by the way, the preface, or the, you might say the context of this, we have to go to the other Gospels. The context of this is that Jesus cast out a, a demon out of a man. If we go to Matthew chapter 12, the parallel passage, it's, also, it's Matthew 12, 22, and then also in Luke uh, chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> there were told, then, they, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil or a demon, blind and dumb. So there, Matthew tells us, this is Matthew chapter 12 at verse 22, that they brought a man to Jesus who couldn't see and he couldn't speak. It's a pretty pitiful condition because he can't see what's going on and he's unable to communicate. So they bring him there and it says, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb, that is inability to speak, both spake and saw. And here we, I think we begin to understand the opposition of the scribes. Now, we'll see that it was also the Pharisees involved. Matthew tells us that. Uh, and all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? That's another way of saying, is it, could this be anything other than the Messiah? They see this wonderful miracle done. Here's a man who's blind and who can't speak, and it's clearly related to demonic activity. Jesus cast the demon out, and the man's sight is restored and his ability to speak. We're not told how long he'd been in that condition. This could have been from childhood. It could have been fairly recent. We're just not told. But we know the man was in a pitiful condition, and now he can see. His eyes are open. And the wonderful thing about when Jesus opened people's eyes, if you remember in John chapter 9, the man born blind, I remember uh, Dr. Grist came. He was an eye doctor and a missionary uh, to Africa, and he told us that Sometimes, and I've mentioned this before because it really made an impression on me as a young seminary student, he said sometimes when people receive their sight after they've been blind for a long time, and what he told us also was if a person has lost their sight after they had it, we can sometimes restore it. If a person is born blind, the mechanics are just not there. He says there's nothing we can do. And the man in John chapter 9, he was born blind. Because remember the apostles said to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They figured you couldn't be in that bad of condition unless you'd done something awful or your parents had. And Jesus said neither this man nor his parents sinned, meaning as a resulting in this. He wasn't saying they were sinless. But he said, but that the glory of God might be manifested in him. In other words, God allowed this to happen because he's going to heal him and be glorified. And so Christ, as you know, he made mud, put it on the man's eyes, told him to go wash, and he did that. This is a, a wonderful miracle. But what Dr. Grice told us is that some people, after they'd been blind from childhood and they received their eyesight as adults, he'd had some people say, I wish I was still blind because it is so difficult to function. Now there's depth, there's color, there's movement. I never had to deal with any of that. And he said they regretted actually receiving their sight because they were so used to functioning as a blind person that it was a whole different world for them. Now, the reason why I mention that, Jesus not only gave that man his eyes, that's literally what he did, he gave him the ability to function with his eyes. The man was a pretty awesome guy, actually. He stood up to the Pharisees, if you remember, when they were quizzing him and they were in opposition. They said, how did he do it? How did he do it? And they asked him several times, and finally he said, I've already told you. He said, you interested in becoming his disciples? And then they ended up, you know, cursing the man, and they excommunicated him. They put him out of the synagogue and temple, Jesus found him later and asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, who is he, Lord? It probably, that Lord there probably means sir. He didn't know who he was talking to at that moment. But he said, who is he, Lord, that I might worship him or that I might believe in him? And Jesus said, the one, who's, the one who you see and who's speaking to you. And it says, and he believed and he worshiped the Lord. So Jesus did these wonderful miracles he restored the man's sight. He gave him the ability to speak. And what do the scribes and the Pharisees do? They deliberately, in absolute opposition to the goodness of God and what they saw Jesus doing, 
Keep in mind, Jesus is none other than God himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit incarnate. That is, he took a true human nature and became man. That's who they're, they're dealing with. And they look at what he's doing, and all, not just this one miracle, but all the other miracles that he's doing, the kindness that he's showing, and they attribute it to Satan. Beelzebub is a name for the devil. It's a very wicked name. It means in the book you may have read in high school or been asked to read in high school, if you're like some of us, uh, Lord of the Flies. And that's what Beelzebub means, the Lord of the Flies. And so it's a very slanderous term. But they're not just saying that Jesus is empowered by that. They're attributing the spirit that's at work in Jesus to be the spirit of the devil. They're saying he's casting out demons by the prince of the demons. It wasn't the prince of the demons. It was by the Holy Spirit of God. And it was very clear from the works. There was no ambiguity about anything Jesus was doing. You know, God, and we'll see this in a moment, God gives us authorization to question those who claim to be working under the power of his spirit. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, Try the spirits, whether or not they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So it's okay to question things. That's not the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. As some of the neo-apostolics, I've been told by people, Oh, you better not question you know, Mr. So-and-so here, because he's a real apostle. And if you question him, you, you could be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And it's like, no, because the Holy Spirit tells us we're to examine people who claim to be prophets, we are to test the spirits. It doesn't offend the Holy Spirit for you to test the spirits. As a matter of fact, you know, you've, you know the saying, that which is genuine doesn't fear examination, only a counterfeit does. So these guys come up with this, how dare you question anything I say? You're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, or almost, maybe. It's like, no, I don't think so, because the Holy Spirit told me I'm going to check you guys out. Okay, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. So they see what Jesus is doing, it's very clear they knew that he was operating under the power of God. The people, are the, though, are beginning to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. So they come up with the most vile slander they can, not just against Jesus, but against the Holy Spirit. And so Christ warns them. Now the question is, did they, did they commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I don't think they did necessarily, not all of them anyway, because Christ warns them against doing that. And I don't think he would have warned them. Either that or he, they had done it, and he's warning others not to follow that path. So it's a little iffy, to be honest. The nature of sin is confusing, or confusion, so it may be that. So when the Pharisees heard it, Matthew tells us, Mark tells us, that the scribes said it, the Pharisees, when they heard it, that is, they heard what the people were saying, this is the son of David. They, how, they can't, we, can, we don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah because if he was the Messiah, he would come and join our Pharisee club. He'd be with us. He'd be telling us what wonderful guys we are. He'd be dressing in the long robes and have the, you know, the phylacteries and, you know, on his hand and they'd make the fringe on his garments longer and he would do everything we Pharisees do because we're the people. We're never wrong. We're always right. We're the ones that God loves way more than those tax collectors and average citizens, you might say. Remember the two men that went up into the temple to pray? One was a Pharisee and the other was the tax collector. You know the story. The one guy just, I love it, Jesus said he, he went up and he, he prayed to himself, it says. He wasn't praying to God. And he congratulated himself and he also congratulated God for having somebody like him worship God. And if you remember the tax collector, the publican is the old word, now, by the way, it's not Republican, okay, in case you're wondering. The publican prayed, and, uh, and he was a humble man. He was a tax collector, okay? That happens sometimes to people. And he said, God be merciful to me. Literally, God be propitious to me, the sinner. He wasn't concerned about other people. He knew he needed to get right with God. So we see the difference. So we learn about the Pharisees. So when they see people saying Jesus could be the Messiah, is this not the son of David? When they heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by, the, uh, uh, but, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So they said, oh, this is, he, he's not of God. He's, he's got to be doing this by the devil himself. So Jesus then tells them some parables. There's three major ones in his, this discourse. And he confronts them. And I love in Mark chapter 3, verse 23, it says, and he called them unto him. 
That's a powerful statement if you think about it. These guys are in opposition to Jesus. Generally, people who are slandering others don't want to be around the person they're slandering when they're doing it. That's the nature of slander. By the way, you know the word diabolos, where we get the word, well, diabolic or devil? In Greek, diabolos means slanderer. That's exactly what it means. When Paul wrote, nothing here against the ladies because men are guilty of this sin also, but when Paul wrote and told Timothy, make sure that the older women uh, are not slanderers, literally the Greek is make sure they're not diaboloi, make sure they're not acting like devils, okay, because the devil is a slanderer. So here they're slandering Jesus. And now Jesus, so Jesus calls them to himself. And you know what happens when he does that? They come. I don't know exactly how this happened, but he said, come here. I'm assuming he, when it says he called them that he actually spoke a word. And they come. He calls them to himself. Maybe they came in guilt. Maybe they just came in pride. We're not told, but they came when he called them. It's like on the day of judgment. When Christ, he, as he said, the hour is coming. First he said, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. And he said, the hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life, those that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. That's not teaching salvation by works. That's saying that if your sins are taken away, the only thing that's gonna come up in the judgment if you're a believer are those things the Holy Spirit has done in your life, the good works. So we will give account of ourselves, but Christ said, they're going to come forth without, they'll hear his voice. All that are in the graves will come forth. So everyone, if they've died before he returns, they will be raised up. The saints will be raised incorruptible, be caught up with the Lord and will return with him, and then that will be the final judgment. But they will be raised. Here we see Jesus called them to himself, and he said to them in parables, we're told. Now a parable, the Greek word for parable is uh, para. Well, it's, it's from two words, pada, which means alongside, and balo, which means to throw. It's where we get, I've mentioned this before, it's where we get the word ball, balo, it's a Greek word. And so a parable is something you put next to something to measure it or to show it. Another word we have is an analogy. So we could translate this actually and say, he spoke to them in analogies. He gave them some pi word pictures to help them understand. And if you notice what he said to them, he said, how can Satan cast out Satan? Now, what he's telling them, now some might say, well, isn't that kind of what happened? Didn't Jesus get the devil to act against his own interest? And didn't the devil actually, when he murdered Jesus, and that's really what happened when our Lord was crucified. It was an unjustified death committed by wicked men. They murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. He rose again from the dead, but that doesn't lessen the guilt of those who did it. So Satan did act against himself because he thought, oh, I'll kill Jesus and we'll be done with him. Well, <laughs> the devil was done with himself, you might say. He, you know, he cooked his own goose because when he crucified Christ, Christ took away our sins. And by the way, Jesus was crucified according to God's plan and purpose, but the devil had a hand in it because it was an evil work. If you remember um, Jesus, when he gave the sop to Judas, it said the devil entered into him right after that. So the devil was behind the betrayal and the death of Christ as far as earthly things were concerned, but God's plan and purpose was being fulfilled. So the Lord did, actually, and the same thing's true of all wicked men. The Lord did have the devil defeat himself in one sense because he thought, I'll, I'll kill Jesus and we'll be done with him. That's what the Pharisees were thinking, remember? We'll kill this Jesus and then it's all over. It's like, <laughs> you, think, you think so, huh? I always loved the fact that uh, after he raised Lazarus from the dead, when Jesus later was in Bethany, the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, they were plotting to kill Jesus. And it says, and they also plotted, they were going to go ahead and kill Lazarus, you know, Mary and Martha's brother. And it's like, did you guys not get the note on this? Did the memo not make it all the way to the temple? Jesus raised him from the dead, and you're going to kill him. You're dealing with somebody that has power over death. But they, all they could think of, and you see this with the Pharisees also and the enemies of Christ, all they can think about, everything comes from darkness, everything comes from, from death and evil things. They're, that's what they're involved in, that's what their minds are. Their minds are dark and their hearts are alienated from God. So they blaspheme and slander the Lord Jesus Christ and even go to the point of saying the spirit that's at work doing this is the devil. It's Beelzebub. That's how he's able to do it. So Jesus says, how can Satan cast out Satan? Now, what really the Lord is saying, 
and I don't advise paraphrases, but you know, sometimes the commentary can help. We throw it alongside like a parable. What Jesus is going to illustrate to them is, do you really think the devil's that stupid? I'm here destroying his kingdom. I'm here restoring people's sight. I'm here restoring their physical bodies. I'm here comforting their hearts with the promises of God. And do you really think the devil's behind that? The lives that have been transformed, remember the man that was paraplegic and they brought him in, remember they, they busted up the roof and brought him down, that man's life was changed. The widow of Nain, her son was dead and it said it was her only son, she was a widow. She had nobody, Jesus raised him from the dead and restored him. Time and again, you know, uh, Jairus' daughter, a little 12 year old girl, she had died. Jesus came and raised her up and restored her to, his parent, her, to her parents. Uh, I love that because he, then he said, he said, give her something to eat, <laughs> okay? Uh, we just see the practicality of our Lord's ministry. So Christ did all these wonderful works, and they're attributing it to the devil. So Jesus says, because it was so obvious to everyone that Jesus isn't acting by the spirit of, of demons. He's clearly destroying Satan's kingdom. And it's not just that people's physical health was restored. We have men like... Um, Zacchaeus, I always think of the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, you know, he climbed up in a tree to see what he could see. Jesus changed his heart. I love it when it says Jesus looked at him and said, come down Zacchaeus, today I dine at your house. Now the word for to see something is blepo in Greek, and there though it's the word in blepo, <laughs> and just like in English, it means he looked right into him. And that's when John says, you know, when, we see, when Jesus returns, we shall see him, at, we shall be made like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we see Jesus and when he see, looks at us, that's a transforming look. His word transforms. To be in his presence is a life-changing event. And I hope you're in the Lord's presence and have experienced this in the new birth. Jesus is destroying Satan's kingdom. So he says, can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If you have a civil war going on, it's going to destroy the nation, you know, unless it's brought to some kind of an end. And Jesus wasn't interested in making a treaty with the devil. He was going to destroy his works. And if a house, meaning a dynasty, by the way, he's not talking here, I think, about a physical house. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. It's like the house of David, you might say, or the house of Jehu, or you know, whatever. If they're divided within themselves, they're going to collapse if you have internal wrangling going on and trying to uh, harm each other. He said, Satan's not that stupid. Because his kingdom's being destroyed. He wouldn't destroy his own kingdom to, to what? Preserve it? No, because it didn't happen. So Jesus is rebuking them. He's instructing them also, if not them, the people that heard this. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but half an end. Now, ultimately, that is what the devil did. He, like I say, when he uh, who conspired to have Jesus crucified, he thought he was bringing it to an end, but actually he was acting against himself. That's what wicked people do, by the way, and, and apparently also in the demonic realm. And so this happened. Now, Matthew tells us a little more. Uh, and I'm going to just read from there. He says, because um, they're questioning what the Lord is doing or what's motivating. This is from Matthew chapter 12. So he asked him, he says, And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils or demons, by whom do your children cast them out? There were, remember when, in John's gospel, when they said, oh Lord, we saw a man, and it literally says, you know, he was casting out demons in your name, but he doesn't follow with us, so we forbade him. We told him to stop doing it. And Jesus told them, don't do that. So they knew there were people apparently using the name of Jesus to do spiritual combat. And so Jesus asked them, he said, uh, if I'm casting them out by Beelzebub, what are your children doing? <coughs> because you know, there were people using Jesus' name to fight, to do spiritual battle. And know what he says, therefore they shall be your judges. So I'll let them judge you. So they know what's going on. They've experienced that power. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. He said if, if Satan's kingdom is being destroyed, and not just then leaving the desolate destruction of a war zone, 
but the kingdom of God itself is being built by changed lives, by people loving God, by people repenting of their sins. When Jesus said, go and sin no more, when you see people recovered, Jesus said, if that's what's going on, then the kingdom of God has come now. And they should have known that because of John's baptism. But we read elsewhere that the Pharisees didn't go to John's baptism because they would have had to acknowledge that they were sinners. So they didn't want to do that. And so they stayed away. That's why Jesus said, he said, that, you know, the uh, publicans and the, and the prostitutes enter into the kingdom of heaven before you guys. Now, he didn't say unrepentantly, because he said they repented at the preaching of John. When they heard the gospel, they stopped their sinful ways. Things were changed. People's lives were being saved. So Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come unto you. <clears throat> and then he uses the illustration. Or how else can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. Now, someone said, well, when, when did that happen? This is, this is talking about Jesus binding Satan. And uh, most commentators and theologians believe that's what happened at the temptation. Satan threw everything he could at Jesus, and nothing could stop him. He couldn't get Jesus to act separate from the will of God. And Satan was bound. His power was broken at that point, not, not completely destroyed. He's still running around loose for a little while, I think. But Jesus is saying is that you've got to first bind him. And it's very clear Satan had been bound at the temptation because right after that Jesus came back in the power of the Spirit, we're told, and began to preach the gospel and change lives. Then Jesus says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. And so then we, we, as we see this narrative unfold, he says, you know, if you're not with me, you're against me. In other words, you've got to make a decision here. Now, a decision can't save you. Some people think it can. But if you're saved, if the Holy Spirit changes your heart, you will make a decision. And so he says, he that's not with me is against me. Also, remember the man casting out demons. Jesus said there, he that's not against you is for you. But here he changes that a little bit. And he says, he that is not with me is against me. There's no neutrality when it comes to who Jesus is. Okay, If you're not with him, you're against him. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You're either bringing people in and the idea, well, I'm not doing, I'm not doing that, but I'm not doing anything bad. No, if you're not gathering, then you're scattering whether you want to or not. That's why it's important for us to be willing to talk to others about Christ and to pray for them. But then Jesus addresses the, the real problem with these people. He says, uh, wherefore I say unto you, this is from Matthew chapter 12, now at verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And then Jesus adds and says, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. He's saying, you guys need to repent. You need to get right with God because you've got corrupt fruit. Look what just came out of your mouths. And whether they had committed that sin or were just on the edge of committing it can be debated. But he is saying, you guys need to change. Well, how do you make a good tree uh, excuse me, a bad tree, a good tree. Well, pruning will help, won't it? But you almost need a creative miracle. And that's what I think Jesus is saying. As he told Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, you must be born again. So then he says, and, and notice how he rebukes them. He says, oh, generation of vipers. Now, Jesus had probably never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Okay by Norman Vincent Peale. It was a very you know, popular book back in the 40s, I think in 50s and 60s, at least in the 50s and 60s. The idea how, you know, businessmen loved it. How to, how to win friends and influence people. Generally, you're not gonna find in those kinds of books the advice, yeah, tell them they're a generation of vipers. But if people are gonna get saved, they need to know what their condition is. We're totally depraved. We hate God left to ourselves. This idea that, well, you know, I love God, I'm just not a Christian. That's a big fat lie. If your heart has not been born again, then you're dead in trespasses and sins. And that's not a neutrality, that's an opposition. 
The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The word natural there is psuchikos, soulish. The soulish man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The word psuchikos, uh, animalis in Latin, meaning you know, on an animal level, men that are unregenerate function basically like animals. They're territorial, they snarl, they snap, uh, they do all kinds of things, but they don't function on a spiritual level. Jesus here lets them know what their condition is. He tells them, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's saying, here's the problem. The problem with what's coming out of your mouth is what's in your hearts. Your hearts are not right with God. That's why you're doing the things you're doing. That's why you're saying the things you're doing or saying the things you're saying. And that's why you're in trouble with God. You're in serious trouble. You may be beyond the pale or the opportunity for forgiveness at this point. Because the way you get right with God is by the influence of the Holy Spirit changing your heart. And you're saying that the Holy Spirit's work is the devil himself. So the very thing that could help you, you're rejecting. The very, the, if you want to use the illustration of medicine, the very medicine that could save you, you're calling it poison. And you're refusing to have anything to do with it, of course. And if you continue in that, then yes, you will go to hell. You will be damned for eternity because the remedy is being rejected. What else could happen? And so he warns them. He says, your problem is with your heart. Look what's coming out of your mouth. Look at the filthy blasphemous slander that's coming out of your mouth. He's saying that shows you're nothing but a generation of snakes and you need to get right with God because your hearts are corrupt. And then he says a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And then here's a very sobering and very important statement. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. What he's saying is, on the day of judgment, all God has to do is review your words. You want to know if you're saved or not? What's coming out of your mouth? Now you say, so my words save me? No, no they don't. Your words show that you are saved. If there's been a work of grace done in your heart, you're going to love God. Paul actually said... Uh, in Ephesians, at the end, if any man doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. If you've been born again, you're going to love Jesus because he saved you from your sins. He saved you from hell. He took your place and went to hell on the cross. He endured the pain and the suffering that belonged to you so it, wouldn't, it would never come to you. Your Savior loves you if you're trusting in him. So he says that your words are going to either condemn you or they're going to show that you were right with God. They don't save you, but they do show if you were saved and also if you weren't. So Christ does this wonderful work. Now, a couple things I want to just cover real fast here because it is important. The first thing, you know, some people are greatly troubled when they hear this, this the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because they think, you know, I, I've said things, you know, against Jesus before I was saved or I haven't always been holy in my thinking. Have I committed this sin? Well, I do want to tell you the Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be accidentally done. Okay, if you're thinking like, oh, somebody told a joke and they mentioned the Holy Spirit and I laughed, you know, uh, and I hope you don't say, and I told that joke, okay. We don't make jokes about holy things. But if you think, well, did I sin again? Don't do those kinds of things, okay. But you can't accidentally blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Okay, that has to, it's a deliberate sin. Just like we see with the scribes and the Pharisees. It's deliberate it's targeted, it's <laughs> is a, minimally to say it's mean-spirited. It's about as mean as you can get because you're trying to hurt other people. You're trying to cast dirt on the cause of God, and you're destroying yourself. So it cannot be done accidentally, and that's very important. In Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about those who were once enlightened, but then they turned their back. In other words, they knew, they tasted of the power of the age to come, but then they turn away from the Lord. It says you cannot renew those people to repentance. And some believe that is an illustration of what this sin is. If you want to turn there, let's read that because this comes up a lot. Some say, oh, so you can lose your salvation? No, it doesn't say that. That's not what we're saying here. In uh, chapter 6, 
Paul says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. We'll go on and talk about other things if we can. It says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. Look how close they get to actually being saved, but didn't get there. They were religious. They had experienced externally the power of God. They have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, he's not talking about that they've been saved. He's talking about people, they've, they've you know, maybe had some gifts. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon Saul, and it's very questionable whether Saul was saved or not. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he wasn't. But you have sometimes men where the Holy Spirit influences them. So they've become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the good word of God. This would be a, a person, person who professes to be a Christian for a period of time. Uh, and the powers of the age to come, they've been affected. Remember Simon Magus in the book of Acts? He was, it says, actually says he believed. He did have some form of faith. It wasn't saving faith, but at least it was intellectual. And then he tried to buy the Holy Spirit, and Peter rebuked him. Uh, but, and Jesus, Peter said, you're in the bond of iniquity. In other words, you're not saved. It's very clear. Although Simon is a good example of this, where he, a lot of the external operations, he saw, witnessed, and understood it, but his heart wasn't right with God. He was enlightened, but not saved. Very dangerous place to be, and that's why it's important if you're here today and you hear this message, if you're just enlightened, that doesn't necessarily mean you're converted. And a lot of people have a lot of religious knowledge and some religious experience, but their heart's never been changed. And how do you know that? What comes out of their mouth. Uh, and when you say, well, they're not blaspheming. I say, yeah, are they talking about Christ? Do they love the Lord? Do they speak kind words? Or are they destroying people with what they say? Okay, and that's what the Pharisees were doing, and they were unregenerate. So these persons note, and they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, that is, if they, if they have fallen away, if they fall away, apostatize, op, that the Greek word it means to fall away, it's impossible, it says, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. This is talking about someone who turns away and then becomes an enemy of the faith. Okay? Now, we'll let God be the judge of anyone who's gone before, but Ray Comfort brings out the fact John Lennon made a profession of faith because he was watching a TV evangelist, and for a little while he professed to be a Christian, but then he seems to have gone away from it, and then after that he wrote the song Imagine, which is all about a world where there is no God and no Christianity, and it seems that he became an enemy. And Ray Comfort points out the, the biggest enemies of the faith are often those who for a period of time or in their youth professed faith and then turned to sin and turned their back on the cross. And this is what Hebrews is talking about. This isn't talking about someone struggling with sin. This is talking about someone who set themselves to be a full-blown enemy of Christ. If they fall away, you can't renew them to repentance since they crucify for themselves the Son of God. In other words, they're, they're happy that, you know, they think it was great that Jesus was put to death and they don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, and put him to an open shame. And then he uses the illustration, the writer does, verse 7, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and, herbs, uh, and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. That is, the fruits are good. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So he's saying... These people were never saved. They're like ground that was cursed. All it, brought, all it brings forth is weeds. But then, less the, you know, because generally the, the sheep are the ones that faint under these things because they're like, oh no, because I'm so sinful. They're aware of their sin, which is good. See, the, the wicked, if you've committed this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin, you're probably not going to be troubled by it. If a person is troubled, say, I want to be right with God. Oh no, could I have done that? Well, if you want to be right with God, that's not coming out of your own heart. That's something the Lord's working in you. And if you're calling on Jesus for forgiveness, that's not something an apostate does, okay? They turn their backs on Jesus. And if they are calling on Jesus, they're calling on a Jesus of their own imagination, not the real one, 
okay, like the cults often do. But then he adds, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So he says, it's clear from your life that there's been a change. He said, so I'm not, well, I'm not talking about you guys. Also, Hebrews 10 says, if we sin willfully after that, we receive the knowledge of the truth. And he's talking about there, I think, turning away type sin. He said, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. So if someone turns away in, in the book of Hebrews, I think you're in chapter 10 now, right? Yeah, if they turn away and they go, well, I'll just go to the temple. Well, what is it, about 65 AD? You got about five years before that's gone. There's no more sacrifice for sin. The veil was torn. You can't go to some other propitiation. If you're not going to get right with God through Jesus Christ and faith in him, you're not going to get right, period. And that's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. Presumptuous sins are those sins that men do of thinking, well, I can sin and it's okay because of who I am. So what the blasphemy of the Spirit is not, as I said earlier, it's not questioning whether or not a prophet or a preacher or teacher is genuine. You, it's okay to question people. How do you do that? John says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, test the spirits whether or not they are of God. Every spirit that conf does not, excuse me, every first is positive. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So if they're from God, they're going to be talking about Jesus as come in the flesh. His incarnation, the work he did, his teachings, his ministry, his resurrection, his session at the Father's right hand, his coming again visibly, physically, in his human body, you know, one, one Christ, he's going to return again. But they're going to be confessing him. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh now, know what he says, is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, or the Antichrist, of which you have heard should come, and even now it is already in the world. So John doesn't say they're neutral. He says these are absolute enemies of Christ, these people that are claiming to speak for God, but they never talk about Jesus. That's why the prosperity gospel and this neo-apostolic garbage is, I believe, wrong, clearly, because it doesn't focus on who Christ is. The gospel is not central to it. It's all about man. So the blasphemy, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not questioning. And these, these false teachers will tell you, don't question me. I started off earlier and said that. You know, they'll say, you can't question you know, apostles so-and-so because you might be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And it's like, no, the Holy Spirit told me to check these guys out. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, remember Jesus told the Ephesian church, you've put to the test those who claim they're apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. You didn't go, oh, I don't want to, I'm afraid, I better not question this guy. No, you question these guys. When they make these outrageous claims, first you go to scripture, and then listen to what they're saying, and listen to what they're not saying. And pretty soon you can figure it out real quick, hey, this guy's not from God. Okay, and like I say, there's no neutrality in this. Paul said if you preach any other gospel than the one that he preached, which is the one in the Bible, you're under God's curse. So these guys are not neutral, they're enemies of the faith. The second thing is not something that can be done by a believer. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Paul, in speaking about the work of the Holy Spirit, he says, in whom ye also trusted, that is in Christ. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. God's given you his Holy Spirit. He's not going to take it away because you believe in Jesus. So a believer can't commit the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. A believer cannot commit a sin that can't be pardoned because he's already been brought into a state of grace and they're not resisting the Spirit. In Isaiah 59, 21, God speaks of his covenant. As for me, God says, this is my covenant with uh, with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth. That means also they're in your heart, huh? Because if it's in your mouth, they're going to be there. Shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, that is your children, nor out of the mouth of your seed's seed, that's your grandchildren, says the Lord. That's that multi-generational covenant aspect. From henceforth and forever. So God's not going to remove his spirit. In Isaiah 53, God says in verse, uh, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 55, verse 3, God says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. 
And what are the sure mercies of David in Psalm 89, 28 through 37? The sure mercies of David is that God won't, like he did with Saul, withdraw his spirit. He'll, he'll never do that to those that are in covenant with him. And that's a promise not just to the house of David, but to all believers. If you're a believer, the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not going to forsake you. And speak reverently, speak holy, don't listen to blasphemy, don't listen to jokes about Jesus and things like that if somebody thinks they're being funny. Probably the best thing to do is either walk away or just rebuke them and say, I don't want to hear that. I found a good way of dealing with people like that when they say, well, I've got a joke. It's kind of a little off because it's about Jesus. I just tell them, look, I don't want to hear it. And so then they're like, oh, really? You know, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to hear it because I might get tempted to tell it again if it seems funny, and I don't want to be doing that, okay? So don't tell me. That way you're not making them look like an idiot. You know, you're helping them, as they say in Japan, helping them save face, but also you're putting it to a stop. You want to win them over to your opinion. Sometimes you have to just rebuke people. But sometimes it's better to try to get them to see your point and what's going on. But the point is, you can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit if you're calling upon God and trusting in Jesus, because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. So we are told, though, that we can quench the Spirit and grieve the Spirit. In Ephesians 4.30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve means to make sad, okay? So we can do things that make, you know, we can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But we, we do sometimes grieve the Holy Spirit with hardened attitudes and just mean words and just sin in general. But Paul says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because he's going to be in you and working in you forever. And you've been sealed already. So don't do things that, that, that really bring sadness to the Holy Spirit. In other words, turn from sin. And when you do sin, confess it. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, do not quench the spirit. Uh, the word quenched means, you know, pour water on it. Jesus, was, we're told that a bruised reed he would not break, and smoking flax he would not quench. It's the same word. That means don't discourage people. What's coming out of your mouth? Are you encouraging people to love God, to be happy in Jesus? Or are your words killing them? Because you're, you're, if you're quenching the work of the Spirit in the heart of a believer, and the joy of the Lord is their strength, and if you're killing their joy by your attitude and your words, then you're sinning against God. And here we're told believers can do that. Think about, I've, I can name a lot of people that I've met that don't go to church because they ran into some sourpuss Christian that was some Pharisee and had nothing good to say and everything was bad and maybe mistreated him or talked about him or whatever it was. And they want nothing to do with the faith after that. Don't be that kind of a person. Don't quench the spirit. If somebody is smoking flax, they may not be where they're supposed to be completely. But if you see the beginning of that, nurture it. Encourage them. Try to find the good in others. What you need to do is look for the image of God in your brothers and sisters. That's the only way you can have a safe relationship with people. Look for the image of God in them. And I guarantee you'll start loving people more. Because you see, wow, the Lord's at work in that brother and that sister. That is so awesome. Praise God. Because if you love Jesus and you see Jesus reflected in someone else's life, you're going to love them. And wouldn't it be nice if they can see it in you? <laughs> okay? It makes it a little easier for them to love you if you try to do that. Okay? But that's what we ought to be doing is trying to encourage each other. The word exhort means to encourage. So we can grieve the spirit and we can quench the spirit. But we don't want to do that. Praise God, the Holy Spirit's never going to leave you. And so we want to be able to walk with God, and that means to trust in him by his spirit working in us. And we give him all the praise and glory in it because it's all through Jesus Christ our Lord who's raised us from the dead and restored us to a right relationship with God. So let's work on having that right relationship increase and stay away. And if things come out of our mouth that are bad, confess it. If things aren't coming out of your mouth that are good, there's no neutrality. So ask God to work in your heart and to put his word there and love for Jesus in your heart. You'll talk about what you love. Everybody does. So we have before us here, we see a bad example in the Pharisees, but the scripture points us to the good example of those who went on to follow the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that it's true. We ask you to bless us now and be with us. We thank you, Lord, for the sealing work of your Holy Spirit, that mark of ownership, that seal that's been impressed upon us, 
that is your name, Lord Jesus Christ, and you, Heavenly Father. We thank you. We do pray that you would keep us from sin of every nature, forgive us where we have fallen into sin, and we pray you'd fill our hearts with good things, Lord, so that our mouths would reflect your goodness and glory and grace. This we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.